concentration at uh, this measurement here. And the same feature shows up in the prediction. So we have a really anomalously low ozone concentration during that aircraft takeoff and launch. And sure enough, the model captures it. In the same way, there's an anomalously low concentrations here near to the surface between uh, the surface and about 500, I'm sorry, about 700 hectopascals. The model picks that up on some of the days, but it actually misses the beginning of it, which you see here. When we look at the ratios again, there's a lot of scatter. It's hard to really pick out exactly um, what's going on, but you do see there tends to be some high bias in the ozone coming out uh, during the summer. If we move over to Hawaii, so if, if Japan was representing the outflow from Asia, now we're looking at Hawaii, which is representing more of the air having transported further along. And again, I should have been more clear on these panels on the last slide. The first one is the observations. The second one is the predictions. The third is the ratio. And now we're looking at the individual takeoffs from Hawaii as a function of the day of the year. There are March to July observations are missing. So we're, we're looking at January and then we're jumping right to August and then we're missing October and we're going to November, but that's just because the observations weren't present when we were downloading them. So we're looking at what we have. And again, there are some uh, anomalously low concentrations in the observations that, that one might think would be hard for the model to pick up, but sure enough, it gets them. And, and that's really encouraging. And there are also some anomalously high values that the model and the observation pick up. And again, in this case, the anomalously high values that are near the tropopause are not coming deep enough into the model, which gives us this low prediction near the tropopause. So all in all, it looks pretty good. We see some overestimations, some underestimations, but it, it's not wild. So that's really encouraging. When we look at the CastNet monitors, um, here I'm showing you every hour of every day is a scatter plot. And we see generally a, a pretty good relationship between the observations and the model. But of course, there's a fair amount of scatter. If we look at that in space, you see that there are lower predictions in the west, whereas the east tends to be less biased. But if we look at all of the sites as a percentage of whether they're high bias or low bias, there are more sites in the CastNet database that are unbiased, that is between negative 2.5 PPB bias and 2.5 PPB bias, with a tail that is lower bias from 2.5 to 12.7. So this is pretty good performance for a whole year hourly evaluation. Um, we can look at it lots of different ways, but this really sort of tells the story from us thinking about the seasonality, things become more interesting. So on this slide, we have the observations in the upper right, the model, and then the bias as a function of the hour of the day. And what I've plotted on there is the white line is the mean of the observation and the black line is the mean of the model. And so you can see the model is average low bias compared to the model. And you can see that in the bias where in the spring, most of that bias or model is mostly low bias in the spring. But by the time we get, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm jumping ahead in my words. In the early morning, there is a low bias, but by the time we get to midday, that low bias is largely gone. We have a density of observations that are unbiased. And again, as we move into the late night, we start to get lower biased. What we can then do is break the observations down into observations from zero to 5 a.m. local standard time and from 11 to 17 local standard time and look at those as a function of day of the year. And so what we see is in the spring, which is what I was saying earlier when I was pointing to the hourly plots, in the spring, we tend to be low biased. And as we move into the summer, we're unbiased or even a little bit high biased in the morning hours. By contrast, 
If we look at the afternoon hours, we're relatively unbiased, a little low biased in the spring. And as we move into summer, there's more high bias. So we can look at those and use that evaluation to understand the results or put the results in context later when we talk about attribution. Now, like I said, we also looked at the, the satellites. Um, and in this case, here uh, the satellites to the aldehyde product. We compared the in a two from the satellite, the in a 2D high resolution product to the model. And then we also compared the Smithsonian Atmospheric Observatory ozone profiles to the model. And all of these are available in the appendix to the ozone science, I'm sorry, the ozone policy assessment, which is currently available in draft form and, and will be coming out in the final form soon. So if you're interested in looking at different months, what I'm showing here is July, but we did that for other months as well. So in general, the model is doing really encouraging. Um, it does tend to have a, a near tropopause low bias. That low bias tends to be northward of 50 degrees. Um, it's performing similarly overall to the geoskin platform that was used for our, our 2011 system. Um, but it definitely shows some low biases that we'd like to better understand and improve. The aircraft tends to show a little bit more mixed results. It's kind of hard to draw much of a conclusion from there. Um, the cast net observations between June, July, and August are pretty good, but the spring tended to be low. And again, that's probably related to the stratosphere low bias that, that was evident in the SOND evaluation. I didn't show it here, but we looked at the TOR database and we used the TOR five-year average as a climatology to compare to our results. And, and generally at the rural monitors, we tended to agree quite well. When we initially were doing this run, we were comparing it to a version uh, 1102 from Geoschem, and it had sort of the opposite direction. It was a little on the high bias side, whereas this was a little on the low bias side. And so we ultimately decided that we'd stick with hemispheric CMAC for this round of simulations so that we could try using an integrated platform. So again, that led us ask the question, how does using a different modeling system influence the results that we get. We are currently testing a Geoschem version 1101, I'm sorry, 0 .1, uh, and also a version 12.8. So we will see what comes of that. So that gives you a sense for the modeling platform and how it was doing. But really the whole point of this was to get to some attribution estimates. So what I'm gonna to talk to you now about is how we use that modeling platform to come up with estimates of the US anthropogenic, the international, and the natural. So that's bringing us back to what we were talking about before. Then I'm going to show some results and we're going to think about the long range transport, both in terms of the surface concentrations and also in terms of the aloft, which is the transported. When we're at the larger scales, like 108 kilometer, we have more zero outs that we can look at. So we can look specifically at China and India separately from all the other countries of the world, for example. But when we're looking at the surface, Surface results will be working on an eight kilometer model, but we'll also have that 12 kilometer model that I talked about before that's nested down from the 108 kilometer. When we do that, we won't have China and India separated, and you'll see why when we look at the results. So we'll just have the natural, international, and USA. So, how did we do that? So all of these predictions start with a forward model that takes meteorology and emissions. So here abbreviated F for the forward model, M for the meteorology, and E for the emissions. The standard system uses total emissions, which has the sum of all emission sets. The natural emission run only has the natural emissions. The zero international has natural and the US anthropogenic emissions. In this case, we treated prescribed fires as anthropogenic fires, and then, and also agricultural fires. And then the zero USA run, which is sometimes referred to as the US background run, has the emissions that has natural and the sum of international, but it doesn't have the US anthropogenic. So graphically, what does that look like? I'm showing the NOx emissions, the total on the far left, the next is natural, 
The next is the international anthropogenic, and you can see that there are no emissions over the US. There are also no emissions uh, over any of the, uh, the non-continental US areas either. So Alaska there is, is white because those have been turned off. And then the zero USA, which is the natural plus the international without the, um, the US anthropogenic emissions. We can take all those different forward models and we can estimate the contributions by the equations down below here. So natural is simply the zero anthropogenic forward run. The USA contribution is the total run minus the zero USA. The international is the total minus the zero international and so on. But when we do that, we end up with a nonlinear system producing results that don't perfectly add up to the total. And that's where that residual term comes from. The residual is the nonlinear component. So after we've estimated natural, USA, and international, we subtract those off of the total to calculate the residual. But we don't stop there. We take that international component and we split it into pieces like China, shipping, India, Canada and Mexico and other. So we have lots of things to look at and uh, it's, it's you know very exciting. So again, we'll start here by, by looking at the average transport just to give you a sense of what we're talking about. So in this case, we're looking at the aloft measurements and you can see in April, the clear transport pathways, by the time you get to July, it's more disturbed. In October, it's still disturbed. And if we were to look at the surface concentrations, again, in April, the transport pathway is more clear than it is in July. And again, I've plotted a reference that has the USA, Africa, China, and South America, so that you can look at these plots and understand what you're looking at. But what we're gonna do now is break those into pieces. So we're looking at April, aloft, so at about 500 hectopascals. The green, remember, is always natural, blue is international, and it's USA. So what I'm showing you is that aloft, you have huge concentrations in April from natural sources. That represents the stratospheric contributions, as well as, for example, the April fire you would get in Indonesia and other places that are closer to the tropics, whereas you don't see the fires until later in the year in the mid-latitudes. When we look at the international shipping in April, there's not a lot to see there. The concentrations are heavily weighted towards the pole. As we look at Canada and Mexico, there are some high concentrations down by the Yucatan, high contributions, I should say. When we look at the other anthropogenic, there's, there's a lot going on there. So this represents everywhere that we haven't talked about so far. And we can look specifically at the China contribution. And you can see that the China contribution is a small component of the overall. And then we look at the US contribution. And it's important to remember that just like we are downwind of other countries, other countries are, are downwind of us. So you can see that our contribution to other countries is in the same general range as China's contribution is to other countries as, as well. So this is again at 500 hectopascals in April. Now we're looking at July. July uh, in the aloft area, now you're seeing higher natural contributions further over the continents that tend to have moved northward closer to the mid latitudes. Again, that's representing the fires, it's representing the soil knocks, it's representing all the natural processes. When we look at international shipping in July, things have shifted a little bit. We no longer see the centralization around the pole. Uh, we see a more evenly spread contribution with a few hot spots. When we look at Canada and Mexico, it's now sort of blowing out the other side of um, the Latin American peninsula. And when we look at the other anthropogenic international contributions, a lot going on here. Um, and again, so that has transport from Europe, from Africa, from Russia, from China, from India. And I'm just going to show the, the China piece here in July. So now the uh, China transport is a little bit less uh, far reaching from the continent, but there are still contributions over the US. And remember, we're at 500 hectopascals. And the same can be said for the US to other countries. 
Now, our focus is primarily on the US. So we like to look at the contributions to the US. And in general, it's nice to split the country into two pieces. There's the East and the West. One of the things I wanna point out to you in this upper right-hand map is that the West has all of the high elevation areas, excluding the Appalachian Mountains, which still aren't as high as some of the mountains in the West. So high elevation areas are this darker gray, the lighter gray is all of the West, and the darkest, the black, represents the near border areas. And so we can think of the, the country as East and West, but we can also think of it as high elevation, low elevation, we can think of it as near border and non near border. When we look at the West and the East and high elevations, that's a little bit less important, but it'll come into to play later. So we're looking here at the seasonal evolution of natural, as well as the India in red, the international shipping in purple, China in maroon, Canada in dark, Canada and Mexico, primarily Mexico here, in dark blue, other non-US anthropogenic in lighter blue, gray is the nonlinear, and the USA is the orange. So remember in the West, you're, you're at high elevation and you haven't had a lot of interaction with the US continent yet. So you don't see as much of that anthropogenic US contribution above the US. As you move eastward, you start to see that the contribution from the US is is going up, but remember we're still at a very high altitude, so the concentrations have not mixed upward as much. We can focus in on just the anthropogenic pieces, so now I've just removed the uh, natural piece, and there are a couple interesting features to note here. One is that the long-range international, so that would be your, your China and India, tend to decrease as you move into the summer, and we expect that because the lifetime of ozone has gone down. This is in contrast to the Canada-Mexico transport, which is actually increasing. So of course that also makes sense if we think about the fact that Mexico is operating more like a local source than it is like a transported source to some of the areas in the West. When we move to the East, really more all of the international sources are, are decreasing as we move in towards summer. And the other country contributions at the aloft elevations is anywhere from 10 to 15 ppb, depending on the time of year. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm flipping things around and I'm just reminding us that everybody's downwind of somebody else. Um, so in this case, we're looking at the uh, contributions to the European Union. Um, here I have the other non-US on top because at the time that I made this plot, I didn't have European Union separated by itself. Um, but you can see that other countries are contributing large amounts to the European Union, not least of which among them, the USA. So here we have the USA in orange, Canada and Mexico in dark blue, China in maroon, international shipping in purple, and India in red. In addition to the EU having upwind sources, so does China. So in this case, we do have China by itself. So you can see that China's local contribution to the upper troposphere increases in the summer. But you can see that they have international contributions from upwind areas as well. Among them, of course, is even ourselves. So it's important to remember that when we think of long range transport, it's not a one way street. The Northern Hemisphere is acting like a circle. And so everyone's upwind of somebody else. Oh, and my little joke there was that um, when I look at the EU, um, I'm including the UK as well. So that's just based on when this plot was made. All right, so now we're gonna move down to the surface. We're looking at April. And again, in April, you can see the natural coming along this transport patterns coming out of uh, Asia coming over to the US, but these are the natural contributions. When we look at the surface and international shipping, we now see a lot of international. So remember the shipping is all of course at the surface. And so the contributions are larger and you can really see that here along the Pacific coast. When we look at Canada and Mexico near the surface, they obviously have their largest contributions to themselves, but you can see that the Canada and Mexico contribution creeps inward to the US to the 
to the April average concentration of between two and four PPB, depending on where you are. When we look at China at the surface in April, when the temperatures are low, that transport pattern is still pretty active. And you can see that it encroaches into the US a little bit, probably into California and Nevada. Um, and when you look at April US contributions, they're primarily local, but then this transport pathway to Europe is pretty evident. Um, and just a, a fun fact here, a fun note is that um, some of the only reliable observations that we have are from near Paris in 1876. And what you would hope is that our model natural would be consistent with a pre-industrial atmosphere as it was measured. But because we have so few measurements during that time period, one big question is would those concentrations be representative of the rest of North America? What this plot shows us is that we're actually doing pretty well where that pre-industrial observation would have been. And no, it is not representative of the rest of North America. Okay, now we're moving into July at the surface. So this is where we're typically having the um, largest US contributions and when we typically have our ozone season. And now the natural contributions you don't see the clear transport pathway across the Pacific at the surface, but what is happening is there's lofting at the semi-permanent low system off the coast of Asia, and there's a semi-permanent high system off the coast of the Western US that brings those concentrations back down. So there is transport happening in the model, it's just not as clearly happening at the surface. When we look at the international shipping, now you see lots more ozone being produced by international shipping. It's, all, it's kind of fascinating how it really shuts off the transport into the US is relatively small. And that's likely because the ozone is being produced over active halogen chemistry um, and then uh, is also subject to high deposition. Um, but of course it does encroach into the US and it doesn't go to zero. So we're between 0.1 and two uh, when we're at this light blue color. Um, when we look at the surface for Mexico, you can really see Mexico coming in in July into the Western US, into uh, Arizona, New Mexico, even as far up as, as Colorado perhaps um, at two to four PPB in July, but it really depends on the day. Remember the days that are most conducive to transport are usually less conducive to local photochemistry. When we look at, at China, it makes perfect sense that in July when transport is less efficient, China's contribution is mostly to China. But of course, on this scale, uh, there's between 1.1 uh, and 2 PPB contribution in the rest of this area. So we're not resolving that small bit over here. Um, and the US contribution is, is similar again. We see the local contribution is very large. The transport pattern is still present, but it's more muted because the lifetimes of ozone are shorter. But beyond this clear transport area that's up in the two to four PPB range, there's a large area that's between 0.1 and two PPB. So now we're going to go back to the surface. We're going to go back to looking at things seasonally. And this is a little bit different because now we're looking at the 12 kilometer modeling. So the 12 kilometer resolved results and we're looking at the surface of the US. I'm still breaking things up by west and east for now, but we'll get more distinctions in just a moment. So what we see is that the natural contributions are peaking in the summer. Now remember what I said was we're probably underdoing the stratosphere back here in the spring. So there's probably some natural contributions that we're not getting. But you can see that the international contributions are peaking in March to April, maybe even March to May, and decreasing as we move into sort of the traditional ozone season for the US. When we look in the east, we see that the um, international is smaller in general, and it decreases more clearly in the summer. The natural component has a double peak feature happening in um, 
late April as well as early October. Um, and the anthropogenic is very clear. One of the things I want to point out here, though, is we're averaging over the entire West. The purple rings here represent urban areas. And you can see that most of the West is not urban, whereas most of the East is urban. And so these are sort of unfair comparisons when we look at the two, because if we chose just an urban area, for example, the Colorado area, it would tend to look more like the Eastern average than it would like the Western average. But nonetheless, these give us a, a high level picture of what's going on. Now what I'm looking at is I'm splitting the West into the near border areas and the high elevation areas. And what you see is that the near border areas have a lot more international when you move into the photochemical active season, the traditional ozone season. Whereas the high elevation areas have a large amount of international contribution during the spring, but it tends to taper off as you move into the summer. So being near the border, you have long range transport during the spring. Remember that's your Asia, and Europe and Russia, et cetera. And as that long range transport tapers off as you move into summer, the semi-local transport from Mexico and Canada increases. And as a result, you have this buffered, longer international transport season at the near border areas than you do at the high elevation areas. Um, and here I'm defining high elevation as above 1500 meters above sea level as defined by the 12 kilometer grid cell average. Um, and one of the features that pops out is when we look at the top 10 days for, in this case, international is in red. This is the one place where I broke my color scheme. Um, what you see is that areas that are like non-attainment areas, for example, Phoenix and Colorado, tend to have lower international contribution than the areas around them. Why would that be? Well, in a non-attainment area, there's local photochemistry contributing to the larger concentrations, which tends to push the top 10 days towards the traditional ozone season when transport is at a disadvantage. And when I say transport is at a disadvantage, I mean anything beyond 100 kilometers from the border. So as long as you're relatively far from the border, you start to see these, these non-attainment areas exceedances happening more often in the summer, especially in the model that's not picking up some of the stratosphere. And as a result, the international contribution to those areas is lower than you would expect from the Western average as a whole. When we look at the West and the East and really focus in on the international component. Now you can really see what I was talking about. We see that international shipping, China, and the rest of the international is peaking here in the spring in between March and April. Whereas the Canada and Mexico contribution, this darker blue, is peaking closer to August. As a result, you have that clearly buffered effect of long range transport contributing more international in the spring and close international contributing more in the summer and a more flat profile for international as a whole. Whereas in the East, the long range transport is the long range transport is basically inclusive of Canada and Mexico, and all of them are tapering off as we move into the traditional ozone season. Now, one uh, fun thing we did to evaluate the model was we compared the population weighted impact uh, for emission sensitivities from our modeling system to some other modeling systems, including one published in 2009 uh, in the supplementary tables S1. And we found pretty good agreement in the relative magnitude of the sensitivity to India and China, even though the absolute magnitudes of their contribution were different. So what that tells us is that the absolute magnitudes are maybe different because of 
differences in efficiency of transport pathways based on the modeling year we chose, but their relative contributions are more equally sensitive to those transport patterns. Okay, so we've used our zero out simulations to provide estimates of contributions. Sometimes it's easier just to call it attribution because people have very strong feelings about whether a contribution is source apportionment or a contribution is tagging or a contribution is zero out. But for the moment, we'll just call it zero out contributions. We looked at the global natural, the international anthropogenic and the domestic anthropogenic. We split out the India, China, and international shipping, and we have some runs that we're working on that allow us to distinguish between Europe, Russia, uh, East Asia, and West Asia um, that we'll be adding to this body of work. What we found is that our results are generally consistent with the literature, like HTAP phase one, HTAP phase two, the Jaffe 2018 paper. The USB, that is the natural plus the international, is higher in the West than the East, and it can be a significant contributor on specific high ozone days. The long range transport tends to happen more in the spring than the summer, which is a nice feature to help us distinguish which types of national transport. The Canada and Mexico here are operating as a short range transport, which is a nice distinction to have. It helps us understand why it's easier to see the international contributions some places than others. And there's a big difference between the West and the East, especially at the surface in the natural contributions between the West and the East. And this makes sense because of the high elevation and because of other things going on there. But what I wanna point out is sometimes you won't see this if you do a regional source apportionment estimation because there's very little natural sources as you move further west. You can imagine as you move to the east, all the air is coming from the west and it's moving towards you. It's picking up emissions as it goes, including those natural sources. So if you take a, a measurement of source attribution in the east, it includes all of that evolution. Whereas if you took one in the Pacific Ocean in a regional domain, there wouldn't have been very much natural ozone contributions because it wouldn't have reached the surface at that point. So we have to make sure that when we're thinking about contributions, we're thinking about it on a holistic perspective and we're not just thinking of the boundary condition as this mythical thing that includes you know only one thing it's not a black box that contains whatever you want it to it is made up of a combination of sources both natural and international anthropogenic as well as some residual u.s contribution okay if we looked at the top 10 days at the surface during the summer, the international contribution at most places was between one and 15. Near the border, we had some contributions up to 30, but I'll tell you at those individual sites, I think the model tends to be a little high biased. Um, and in the Eastern US, that decreases from all sources, the international decreases as you move into the summer. Whereas in the Western US, the contribution from Canada and Mexico is, is increasing. So hopefully that sketches out the, the global sources, or in this case, really the Northern hemispheric sources of North American ozone and how it varies depending both on the source, on the season, the geography, and even the topology. And with that, I'd love to take questions. Looks like I went a little longer than I meant to. We have a few questions. Thanks, Baron. We have a few questions come up on the Q&A panel. Excellent. Um, starting with the first one, um, how will these results inform future development of CMAC? Ah, that's a great question. So the potential vorticity is something that is uh, being worked on in terms of increasing the, the scale at stratospheric contributions. It's something we're thinking about. That's number one. Um, number two is that when we look at these results, we do a lot of different types of evaluation and it helps us to, to think about what we could do better in the future. Um, for example, um, 
how much did it matter that we did day specific soil nitrogen oxides in India? Probably not a lot in terms of the contribution to the surface in the US. So we can use these results and sensitivities to develop better rules for developing emission inventories to make it easier to do this type of work in the future. So that's not development of the CMAC modeling code, but it's development of the CMAC modeling system. Um, in addition, one of the things that we can do is we, we can really see in this modeling system that the fires tended to be overpredicted in, in several places, which is consistent with other literature that has, has talked about this in CMAC. And so that adds to the body of evidence there. Um, another place where this comes up is the CMAC model is uh, in the process of developing an integrated source attribution methodology. I think I got that acronym, right? The ISAM. And zero out results help to provide a, a reference to see whether or not those new source apportionment technologies are generally consistent with what we've seen in the past. We don't expect them to be the same, but when they're wildly different, we should be asking why. And if we can explain that, great. And if not, then we need to, to iterate. And so there's been a lot of iteration using zero out source apportionment methodology. Um, now, another place where this can really help is um, James East is a postgraduate fellow who's working with us uh, over in ORD, who's implementing a, a satellite data assimilation system that we collaborate, well, we were stakeholders in the health and air quality applied sciences team that NASA put together last. And they developed a satellite assimilation system that they were able to do a technology transfer to us with. So now that we have these hemispheric results for a whole year with lots of source attribution, we can then take the satellite data assimilation, look at where it would modify emission inventories on the global scale, compare that both to our source attribution and to our international emission inventories to see what changes we would make. So those are a few of the places. Um, another, uh, I wouldn't say these results really pushed it, but we ended up having to patch the boundary conditions from these results with the dimethyl sulfide from a newer version of CMAC uh, hemispheric runs because it was important for us to get that for, for regional haze. Um, I'm gonna stop there. And if I think of more ways, I'll come back to that question because it's a great question. Okay. Um, the next one is in a very early slide showing generic source contributions to ozone, it included methane as a source. Can you explain that source a little? Yeah, so methane in this source is really talking about the post-industrial methane. So uh, imagine, uh, or actually it might be methane as a, as a whole, but um, there's methane that's naturally occurring in the atmosphere and that methane is reacting with nitrogen oxides, both naturally occurring and anthropogenic um, to produce ozone. In addition to that naturally occurring methane, we release methane when we do a variety of activities, um, including oil and gas production, including, um, including changes in, in temperature and climate that would, for example, melt tundras and release uh, methane, as well as methane being released from the ocean as temperatures change there. Um, so you have not just the naturally occurring methane, but you also have methane enhancements that are coming from both direct anthropogenic influence as well as indirect anthropogenic influences. And as that methane increases, we change the methane concentrations in our model, which are largely prescribed in air quality models versus dynamic and climate models. And that prescribed concentration is creating ozone. And so ozone everywhere has methane in it how you attribute that, how much of that methane was post-industrial and thus probably the result of anthropogenic activities, how much of it is pre-industrial, and then of the uh, post-industrial, how you attribute that to different areas um, is an, an area of research and interest. And then there's, you know, if you had a 
really high release somewhere, um, just a, a like a big leak somewhere, you could have a, a very local influence of that leaked methane. But in general, when we're talking about these larger, broad scale methane concentrations, we're talking about a slow reacting compound that is creating ozone over scales uh, that are regional rather than local, regional to hemispheric to global rather than local. Okay. What ideas are you pursuing for addressing the low bias in the tropopause? Yeah, so there's a couple things. Uh, one, you know, we're looking at different modeling systems to see how they perform for this same type of um, of modeling. So I didn't show it here, but um, I did put in a citation in the presentation that you'll be able to look at later, which is the International Geoschem Ninth Annual Conference, where I showed differences in the satellite sonde evaluations between Geoschem and, and CMAC. And so Geoschem, uh, at least at the version that I was showing then, which was version 12.0.1, um, was doing a pretty good job about the tropopause there. And so there are questions about that. Is it a meteorological phenomenon, the way we resolve the, the tropopause, or is it the dynamic UCX chemistry being used for the stratosphere and geoschem versus the potential vorticity scaling that we're using? And so we need to understand uh, those different components to then improve upon it. So if we determined, you know what, our vertical structure is okay, it's the way we're introducing the stratosphere, then we could take some of our geoschem runs and provide top conditions to the model and allow it to transfer down within the CMAC model. And that would be one way to address it. Um, so we are exploring different things with it, but there's not a, a, a clear path to fixing that in hemispheric CMAC to my knowledge, but that's a, a great question to, uh, for the community at large, but also I imagine um, Rohit Mather is thinking about that particularly. Okay. Um, can you briefly outline the two mechanisms for reduction of transport in summer compared to spring for Pacific meteorology and chemical mechanisms? Yeah. So. Um, as the temperatures increase, the lifetime tends to decrease. So you're essentially speeding up the chemistry that is converting NOx into nitric acid and other terminal nitrogen species. And so as a result, you have the ozone produced earlier, if it's going to be produced at all, you have lower ozone production efficiencies um, on those scales. But as a result, you then have a longer time period for deposition to be occurring to those species. So higher temperatures, you can think of it as more photochemically active um, and also the, the turbulence uh, induces more deposition, I think. Um, so you have more losses. So that's why as you move up in the atmosphere, you tend to see less of this is that the temperatures higher in the atmosphere are more stable less changing. And as a result, the lifetime is more consistent, higher in the atmosphere. Um, I didn't, didn't really understand the second part of the question. Well, I guess uh, the question was trying to think about the processes, both from a meteorology perspective and the chemistry perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, from a meteorological perspective, you have different transport pathways. So when we talk about things like the semi-permanent low and the semi-permanent high, those aren't perfectly static and those are, are certainly moving. Um, and in addition to that, you have convective systems that are occurring at different frequencies depending on the time of the year. And remember, a convective system uh, is an extreme low system. And in that low system, you're lofting air up from the surface and you're bringing air from the surface down. So to the extent that you have precursors near the surface, because that's where their emissions are, and you add a convective system, you're lofting those precursors and their products higher into the atmosphere. And so if you're moving them away uh, from the surface and if they stayed at the surface, they would have a, a shorter lifetime, then their likelihood of reaching the surface downwind has decreased. Okay. Um, could you comment on the aircraft emissions and the fidelity of the data? Mm 
Yeah, great question. Um, so the aircraft emissions that we're using at the hemispheric scale are coming from the HTAP aircraft and they're being scaled by the SEDS data. I don't have a sense for how good those are. I think that there are um, in the 2016, I think version one, but it might be the 2017 emissions platform that's happening right now. There's been some improvements to the uh, to the aircraft emissions. And I think it'd be really interesting to uh, take something like the SEDS aircraft or the um, or the HTAP aircraft and scale it forward to that year, mask it out for the region and compare the two just to get a sense for how important is it to be doing year specific in terms of raw magnitudes. So there's the uncertainties there, um, which I suspect are, are relatively large. Um, and then there's the emission factors for aircraft, which I know very little about. Um, so I won't speak to that. Um, and in this talk, we're primarily talking about ozone. So we're really talking about the nitrogen oxides. So we're, we're focusing on the combustion processes, which are probably more certain than um, some of the, you know, landing and takeoff particulates. Right. And related to the same sector, uh, two part question from the same attendee. Uh, do you have any insights on their contribution to ozone similar to shipping contribution? That's a great question. There's, um, I believe it's a Tim Butler paper from maybe two years ago, um, looked at shipping an aircraft separately using um, his tagging system called TOAST. Um, that's a good paper that I would uh, recommend you to. We didn't separately quantify aircraft in this case. Um, one of the things we were just talking about this morning with respect to a modeling system is that both the HTAP system and the um, the SED system, or the SED system in particular, it specifies global international flights and global domestic flights. But that's actually going to make it hard for us to distinguish because even if you had them spatially, um, so SEDS has done a fantastic job of making all their data readily available in a graded format. And I suggest that everybody go out and download as much of it as they can <laughs> and, and play with it and work with it and learn from it. Um, but when they provide the aircraft data, I believe that all of that is merged together. And so you can't distinguish between domestic aircraft and international aircraft over the US in that graded system. They're not held separately, unless I'm mistaken. And so, uh, yeah, I forget exactly why I went down this rabbit hole. <laughs> no, I, I think we, we were trying to distinguish between shipping and, and aircraft. But that, that was oh, it. yeah. So um, because I, I think that takes a lot of analysis and consideration. So when a flight is an international aircraft that is over the U.S., whose is it? Um, that's a complicated question. It's a landing and takeoff which in our, in our modeling system, landing and takeoff over the US is coming from the 2016 emissions modeling platform, whereas the cruise altitude outside the US is, and landing and takeoffs are coming from a completely different system. And so there's a lot of good questions to be had about whose emissions are whose, and, and do you just draw a box around the US? And if it happened over the US, even if it wasn't coming to the US, it's, it's U.S. aircraft. Um, now, no one, no one here has specifically asked me to distinguish aircraft uh, as domestic or not domestic, but it has policy implications. And so I think one reason that we didn't explore that one as much was because of that. Okay. Um, all right, mo moving on, uh, Baron, next one. How does satellite data compare to your results shown? Does Landsat data improve the results if interpolated? Um, so the satellite results um, are shown both here and as I said in the draft policy assessment. Um, I would argue that the performance is quite good for ozone. Uh, even for NO2, it's relatively good, um, but it depends where you are, right? It depends an awful lot on where you are. Now, in this case, the way that I've processed the modeling system um, probably prevents too quantitative an analysis of it. Um, 
but you're asking about the Landsat side of thing, and I, I don't really know what you mean about the interpolation by Landsat. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if it's to do with the land use data, but since it's not clear, um, we can move on and, and maybe have the speaker um, engage with us offline later. Great. Uh, moving on, Baron, next one. Do you have the ability to determine the source regions where international shipping impacts originate? Uh, I'm wondering how much emissions control areas, both in the US and in other nations, address the issue, or the majority arises in locations outside of coastal regions? I'm sorry if you said it already. <laughs> No, no, no. It's a good, it's a good question, and it's a tricky question. And uh, I'm going to pull up a figure to help us talk about it. Hopefully, it'll be the surface one. Okay. So right here for international shipping, you can see it if you look closely. Um, so inside the U.S. ECA regions, um, we're using the 2016 modeling platform, and outside it, we're using the um, the shipping more generally. Um, the eco regions around Europe, we are not resolving at all um, separately, but you can actually sort of see the vestiges of the eco region um, upwind of the US here. So if you look off the Pacific coast there, you see a slightly lighter color just following a slightly darker color um, right around um, the eco. And you know, I think that's probably some artifact of the way we're we're treating it. But as a result of having multi-scale modeling systems, we can run attribution on the eco region and non-eco region, both in the 36 kilometer results and in the 12 kilometer results. The results that I'm showing you are just from a zero out of the entire shipping. So while we can resolve it and we've set up the system in a way that we can resolve it, and I believe subsequent um, attribution studies probably will, these results don't. Okay. Um, next one, uh, in the East, what levels of international contribution are seen in the Northeast, i.e. the New York metropolitan area, New England? Yeah, so in the New York metropolitan area. Um, so what I'm showing is spatial maps um, that are gridded, right? If you're interested in a specific monitor, we can extract that monitor and do uh, the same type of evaluation we've done here, except you can also look at the model performance for that. In the New York uh, like in the New York metro area, like New York City metro area, I don't think it's very large. There may be a high elevation New York State site that is, is a little bit larger. Um, but I, I wouldn't want to speak off the cuff about any particular sites. Um, but I, I will be putting together an analysis that does look at the monitors in the non-attainment areas and does analyses of those. Okay, um, one more. Uh, recent model performance evaluations of EPA's 2016 platform have shown a similar underprediction of ozone in the spring months in the corner. Yeah. Do you think the HCMAC results are a significant reason for this negative bias? And do you have any indication that the geoschem simulations also under investigation may help with this bias? Yeah, so we have a simulation that's currently running where the boundary conditions were produced from the GeoSchem 12.0.1. And so we will be able to see those differences more clearly soon. We have not, I don't think the runs are complete and I don't think we've processed the runs, but we are exploring that as, as a question. When we initially ran this uh, hemispheric run and didn't have the, um, uh, did I go too far? and didn't have the regional runs yet, you know, we were struck by these low biases in the spring that tended to be stronger at night than they were in the day. Um, and we were trying to interpret those and think about what it was that those likely meant. Um, and I think there was some thought that, you know, we're using a 108 kilometer model, 
with a um, 10 to 15 meter first layer. It could be that there's overestimation of deposition, um, but the fact that we still see that low bias after we've passed it into the 12 kilometer model makes us think that, you know, it probably is more a larger scale feature coming into the model. But that being said, it, it's an open question, right? Will we get less low bias if we give it more ozone? Sure. Are there reasons to think we should? Definitely in the free trope, less so as we get closer to the surface uh, in the SON record. Um, but yeah, there's reason to believe that, that that could be it. I think we just have to be careful about uh, concluding that giving more ozone is right because we have a low bias. Okay. Uh, one last comment. It's not a question. Um, you're welcome to comment on the comment if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> and the comment is, uh, where is that? I just had this. Yeah. The, um, since you're using Megan, uh, you can turn off soil NOx due to fertilizer application and anthropogenic nitrogen deposition to get the better estimate of natural and anthropogenic emissions. Yeah, so this is a really good point. So when we ran, um, so what we ran was Megan and the Berkeley Dalhousie nitrogen soil parameterization, both as implemented in GeosChem. At the time, I believe there was a way to configure HIMCO to separately quantify the anthropogenic and the non-anthropogenic. Um, at the time, we were having trouble getting that configured and running. I think it may have even been more cleaned up since then, so it's easier to do. Um, but we ultimately decided that it was more important to, to go ahead um, than to wait for separating those. Since then, um, I've been looking at the Copernicus modeling system. They've made all of their emissions uh, available online including their soil NOx database. So they have it separated both by natural biome specific um, as well as uh, fertilizer enhanced and separately for the anthropogenic nitrogen deposition onto the surfaces that are re-emitted. So I think there's a lot of potential for that system and the emissions that are made publicly available and ready to use, you know, they take some massaging to get them into CMAC, but uh, those cover the years 2000 to 2015. So that is just an exceptional resource that was made available to us. If you do decide to use those systems, I'd encourage you to contact me or to contact um, the primary author of the Soil NOx emissions database that, that they have, specifically because um, the nitrogen deposition re-emission uh, probably had a little bit of a bug in it, and there's an easy fix to clean it up. Um, yeah, but, but separating out the truly anthropogenic from biogenic soil NOx is really interesting for two reasons. One, uh, Lapina et al. Um, 2014 did an adjoint study that showed that soil NOx emissions as, an anth as a natural source, or rather as a source in general, tend to have much more localized effects. So on the global scale, soil NOx is like 80% natural, 20% anthropogenic, but on a localized scale, you can have a much larger anthropogenic part and that localized nitrogen is gonna be highly efficient in terms of making local ozone. So the fact that we have treated that as an entirely natural source is artificial. And we recognize that as one of the limitations of our study. Okay. Thank you, Baron, for the great presentation and um, answering all the questions. Um, here is a virtual round of applause for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, with that, um, I want to announce that this presentation, uh, both as a PDF and a recording, will be made available on the CMAS uh, website. And I have two announcements before we um, wrap up for the day. Let me just pull up the slide in a second. Okay, so, so um, hold your um, dates for the next webinar, the CMAS webinar series.
We have uh, Professor Tassian Albuquerque and her student, Razire Pedrusi from um, Federal University of Minas Gerais, presenting on challenges in using the smoke CMAC modeling system in South America, uh, case studies in urban Brazilian cities. So this will be on Thursday, July 9th at 2 p.m. That's the next one in the series. Following that, we have a two-part presentation from EPA OAQPS. The first one will be on the 2016 modeling platform with a broad overview of the performance evaluation. The date will be announced shortly. And the second part of the same two-part presentation will be a little more of an in-depth evaluation focusing on both area and pollutant-focused evaluation. So hold your dates for the first one, July 9th, um, and two more coming up later from the EPA. And the last announcement for the day is our 19th annual CMAS conference. Um, this year is going to be held uh, the week of October 26th to 30th. And this year, given the general pandemic situation, we will be going virtual. Um, the exact format and details are being worked out and please stay tuned for the call for abstract that'll be coming out really soon. So again, the 19th annual CMAS conference will be going virtual the week of October 26th to 30th. With that, thank you all for attending today's webinar and thanks Baron again for the great talk and hopefully see you all on July 9th.